Austin Miller said, it was cool. What a story. <laughs> I don't know what it is. That was funny. Yep. We were really trying to figure out how long it would take for Joel to notice. Because that's been up there for years. Oh, for real. <laughs> yep. Is no. No. I mean, it would it would be great if it was. The problem is, with this long of a span, there's no way. The moment loading is just too significant. You might be able to hang from it like at the very ends, but yeah, anywhere in the middle, it's just too much. All right, welcome back. Um, hope everybody enjoyed their long weekend. I know I did. Um, I spent some time just being outside and building a giant hammock. That was fun. And then breaking the giant hammock. That was not fun. <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, so let's uh, let's get into this. We're moving into chapter five now. Um, chapter five is it deals with RLC circuits as we have been, but the math gets a little weird because. We're no longer dealing with like integrals and derivatives, but we're talking about second order systems. Uh, and that's why I say this is a, it's a different kind of approach. Um, I was actually pleasantly surprised to find out that my high school junior nephew uh, is also learning about AC systems and learning about sine waves and sine curves and impedances and all of these things. And I'm like, so yeah, they actually do teach these kids, these things to high school kids apparently. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, granted it doesn't have any calculus in it and they don't understand why the formulas are derived the way they are, but that is what it is. So the idea of um, chapter five is we are dealing with AC systems. Okay, it doesn't mean air conditioning. Although it sounds to me like they might have got the chiller fixed in this building. It was full of crap last Thursday. It was awful. It was so cool. Yeah. Hey Gabby. Yeah, and then it was really, really hot the next day. <laughs> it was terrible. But yeah, fixing the chiller there. I think they got a new one. I hope so anyways. Otherwise we're all gonna start basking in our own fluids at this point. Um, to this point in the class, we have only dealt with DC systems. DC stands for direct current. Okay, a long time ago, back in the yester years of humanity, uh, Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison were trying to figure out power solutions. They had discovered that, well, they hadn't really discovered electricity, but they had discovered that electrical systems uh, were very powerful for improving the quality of life of individuals. Uh, Thomas Edison's invention of the light bulb uh, really spawned a lot of, of conversations as far as how can we take this technology and now re reduce the amount of soot in people's houses, make it so that you don't have to friggin' light something on fire in order to see at night. Uh, and and it, was, it was a major improvement in, in history. But then the issue becomes, how do you take electricity and get it to the light bulb? Well, Edison said we need DC systems. Edison's vision was in every neighborhood, there's a block, you would have maybe two or three DC systems that would power the entire neighborhood. 
And then you would have to feed to these DC systems um, and you'd, you'd have to have it just like this. Or another one of Edison's earlier ideas was you, you have a DC system like 2.3 miles away that feeds the house. Now the issue with this is that uh, there is a finite amount of resistance in this wire. And if you were to try to jump, uh, let's say 220 volts over this, over this distance, and uh, Dylan, you're over here plugging something into your wall socket, maybe it's your bandsaw, um, you're only really getting 180 volts. Because there is a DC resistance, and this is in series. Uh, really long wires do have a finite amount of resistance to them. Uh, really short wires, we count them as negligible. Uh, in the reality, there are there is some resistance related to short wires too. But the, the longer you make these systems, the greater the resistance gets. And so this is an issue. Tesla, on the other side, said, well, if you take the voltage and you oscillate it, which basically means you have, you, you bring up the system to 220 volts, and then you bring down the system to negative 220 volts. It's forcing current to flow forward and backward through the system. If you do that, the resistance behaves differently. And that's one of the things we're gonna see today. You do not have nearly as much power loss. And it allows you to run these power lines much farther than otherwise you would be able to. Well, Edison had this big war, tried to convince everybody that AC power was going to kill them. Uh, I believe electrocuted an, an elephant, I think it was, um, as a way of trying to prove how dangerous AC systems were. AC systems were, uh, I mean, they're, they're difficult to work with. But at the end of the day, um, Edison never had a good solution. His solution was we're gonna need like five million power plants in America. Uh, and that it's just infeasible. The, the maintenance costs, the upkeep on all those, it was, it was too much. Uh, Tesla was trying to work on a way where you wouldn't need power lines at all, but you could have these giant towers that would like shoot electricity down houses. Um, that eventually led to the invention of a death ray, but a uh, different story there. Um, so there is a reason why we have AC power in our houses while most of our systems that we use, cell phones, computers, uh, cameras, anything that uses a battery is a DC system. And the difference between those is that AC power transfers farther and does not experience the same voltage losses that a, a DC system would. Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why that is uh, today, later today. But first, in order to really get to that, we need to understand what is AC. AC stands for alternated current. Okay, so AC, DC, the band stands for alternating current, direct current, the band. Um, now what makes AC systems unique is that uh, AC systems, typically the ones that most of us deal with are 60 hertz, 120 volts. Uh, you can get 60 hertz, 220 volts, which is, oh, yeah, it's a different way of doing it, but. Um, I guess it's 110 volt systems. And this is just because this is the standard uh, that a lot of, that, that 
Uh, actually, Tesla helped to develop back when a lot of these systems were being implemented. Everybody just said, we need a, we need a voltage to stick with, and then we're just gonna go with it. And so they picked 110 volts, uh, nominally 120 volts, but about 110 and uh, 60 hertz. And that's, that's just what they said they were gonna go with. We're doing this, we're going here, and everyone else in history has designed exactly for that. Which is why in today's world, even in Europe, even in uh, Africa, they still have AC systems and it's 60 hertz, hey Ben, and 110 volts, which, is, which allows you to, now you won't be able to take your power sockets and go plug them in in Europe and Africa because believe it or not, power sockets are different overseas. Uh, has anybody been overseas to like Europe? Yeah, have you seen the weird power outlets they have? It's dumb, but they didn't want to use the three prong outlets and in some ways, I like some of the European like prong outlets better. And I hate to say that, but I just like them. But we have a very specific wall socket and in order to plug devices in in other countries, you have to use a different wall socket. Um, but they still use 60 hertz, 110 volt systems, okay? And that's because everybody knows just to design for this type of a system. So let's talk about sine curves. If you were to draw a sine curve, there are three features that you need to know to fully define a, a sine curve, okay? If I were to try to write a formula for this sine curve, I would need three different things. First of all, this distance here represents twice the amplitude. Okay? The distance that just from the peak to zero represents one amplitude, assuming that your sine curve is centered around zero. Okay, so this is your amplitude A. Second thing you need to know about a sine curve. What is the distance of one cycle? This distance is your period, which is given as T. The third thing that you need to know in order to fully define a sine curve is where is the sine curve relative to zero? This function right here is not just sine of something, okay? Because sine is supposed to be zero at zero. This is not zero at zero. It's not cosine either. It's a little bit off. So the last thing that we need to know is what is the difference here between this peak and the actual beginning of the sine curve? Okay. And this is solved using a variable called phi, which is a circle with a line through it. Phi doesn't have units of time, so do beware of that. But this is what phi does. Phi causes an offset. So the general form for a sine wave is, uh, let's say, V, the function of time, is equal to A times sine omega t plus phi. I think it's plus. I don't think it's minus. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yep, that's it. That's a sine curve. Okay. If we increase phi, 
the sine curve starts sooner. Just means it's offset from zero that much. Omega, well, I, why do we have an omega here? We don't have an omega here. It does, yeah, it does, it does squish it horizontally. Yes. Which one of these variables has to do with omega? It's T. Okay, because yes, as Dylan was pointing out, if you increase omega, this gets smaller. Wait, so that means if omega increases, then your period decreases. Okay. Um, well, the formula for omega is, whoop, omega is given by two pi times the frequency, or that's equal to two pi divided by your period. Okay, and this is just how we take the distance between peaks and plug it into a formula where, and we just like this omega value. Omega represents your angular frequency. So T or T is your period, F is just your normal frequency, and omega is two pi times F, which is your frequency. Here, F is just equal to one over your period. Okay. So for angular, for, for alternating current systems, usually you're not dealing with square waves, usually you're not dealing with sawtooth waves or triangular waves, usually we are dealing with sine waves. And the nice thing about sine waves are that they are, um, they are a continuous function. Continuous means that they are deriv derivable. You can take the derivative, okay? And not only that, but the derivative of a sine function, which is a cosine function, is also continuous, meaning that you can take the derivative again. This means we're not gonna be seeing weird behaviors. Yes, that is intentional, because with this being a continuous function, uh, it gives unique properties to resistances, capacitances, and inductances. As we talked about last time, if you introduce some kind of an oscillating system, you end up with, all it does is it affects this value here. Because in a capacitor, the current leads the voltage, which means you end up with a negative phi value. And in inductance, the current lags the voltage, which means you end up with a positive phi value. And everything else stays the same. And what we end up with here is, this is a unique way of looking at systems because in AC systems, we're no longer dealing with like derivatives. We're looking at phase angle changes. And that's everything. So it is really important that you understand how sine waves work, okay? Um, how to plot them, how to play with them, etc. It's also really important to know that we can define every cosine curve as a sine curve. Okay, so here, cosine of theta is equal to sine of theta minus 90 degrees. Or if you're in the radian system, that's, so this is specifically four degrees. And I believe as we pointed out last time, C's do get degrees, so. 
in the radian system, it's sine of phi minus pi over 2. Which letter gets radians? Fs. <laughs> you got an F, you get radians. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Uh. So this is an important relationship. We should really only be dealing with one type of system, and that should be sine curves, or I mean cosine curves if you really want to. Uh, but you should only be dealing in one type. If you are given sines and cosine curves, it's important to try to put them all into one. And here's how we do it. A cosine is just a sine, okay? Now, this is interesting because a cosine is the derivative of a sine, which means if you take the derivative of it, of this function, what you end up getting is this function, which just has a phase angle shift. That's it. And that's the reason why in this chapter we don't really use a lot of derivatives because we don't need to anymore. One thing you'll find out about engineers is we don't do math when we don't have to. Um, we do math when we need to. And we can do math when math calls us. But we don't do math if we don't have to. And here this is one of those cases. You don't have to do a derivative, don't. Well, it leads to some very interesting properties. So, okay, does anybody have questions over sine waves? This hopefully isn't anything new to anybody, but maybe the way I presented it. Okay. All right, how much power is coming out of a system like this? Let's say we take this right here and we say let's we're going to plug it into uh, I don't know a capacitor. So here we have a system where we have an AC system where your voltage is equal to uh, we'll go ahead and say 110 volts, 60 hertz. And it goes into just a capacitor. All right. How much power is being consumed by the system? Well, this is going to cause problems because you're hooking up a... I mean, this isn't a dissipative element at all, but it is whatever. What you end up with is, for power, Power is equal to IV. Here, I is equal to the derivative of your uh, voltage. So your power is going to be equal to what? Uh, v sine omega t times V omega cosine of omega t. Where this is your voltage and this is your current function, this is just the derivative of current. And multiply these by each other, P is going to be equal to V squared omega sine omega t cosine omega t. Well, that's gross. We don't really have a nice constant value for this. This is a complex function that involves multiplying a sine by a cosine. And guess what? It didn't matter if I gave you voltage and cosine, you still end up with a complex function that is a sine minus cosine. Now we can take this and we can use, there are trigonometric rules for how to combine these. Uh, sine times cosine is equal to like some value of sine squared. Um, you can go ahead and reduce this further, uh, but I don't want to. This is kind of gross. And this involved me having to do a derivative. 
And remember, we don't want to do that in this unit. There's no derivatives. So what we've decided to say is, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to calculate the actual function for a power. Because here this is, while valid, and this is true, this still doesn't give us a very good result. Every time t is equal to zero or pi over, you know, or every time omega t is equal to zero, pi over two, pi over four, three pi over four, two pi, every time it's, it has any kind of function that is a multiple of pi over four, this becomes zero. I mean, that's, that's true, but does that mean that our whole system is, you know, most of the time is just producing zero power? Actually, kind of, yeah, but different story. But this still doesn't give us a very good measure of what power is. So what we've decided to do instead is say, okay, well, maybe we can just go back and look at voltage, and maybe we can figure out something from a voltage here. And maybe we'll, we'll get a voltage value that represents this entire system. Well, what is this, what is the average voltage over an entire sine curve? If we were to, to take maybe every tenth of this, break it up into sections, and add all these values together, what would we get? A big zero. So our V average is equal to zero. Oh, snap. Well, now we can't use that because if our V average is equal to zero, then you know what, our, our, our current average is also gonna be equal to zero. And that means our, our P average is equal to, to I average times V average is equal to zero times zero? We have an average power value of zero. <laughs> and yeah, this does, this normalizes to zero. This function is centered around zero. If you wanted to make this non-zero, you would have to add another value to it on the end. And by doing that, it's no longer zero. Now it's centered around four. And then it's like, wait, what are we even doing with RMS systems? But the reality is we know if you plug, if you plug a vacuum cleaner into that outlet, that vacuum cleaner is going to use an average current of zero amps. But it still has power. So how does that work? Well, we had to come up with a new way of figuring out this so-called so average. And the idea is you kind of have to take the, uh, the absolute value of this because you're providing power when the system is moving in one direction. The system stops and then you provide power in the other direction. At both of those points, your system is consuming power, even though technically your, your power value becomes negative. So it is consuming power this way, it is consuming power that way. Uh, in both directions it is consuming power. We need a better way of being able to say what is power. Now, we could take the absolute value of this entire function and come up with the average voltage, okay? So taking the average of the absolute value of that voltage produces, oh, excuse me, a different behavior. What we end up with is a value that's called V RMS. To do this, they square it. 
you square your sine function and it is always positive then. And then you take the square root of it. And VRMS is called, this is voltage root mean square. That's what RMS stands for. And the formula for VRMS is VRMS is equal to your V divided by your square root of 2. Okay, if we go back and plug this in here to find our power value, your P RMS, which is just the power root mean square, using the same method as what we're doing for voltage, is going to be equal to Well, it's equal to V RMS times I RMS. Okay? And if V RMS is just V over the square root of 2, I RMS uh, does depend on what your components are. And that is something that we're going to have to find as we go further into the study. Okay? But why don't we go ahead and take a 10 minute break before we get into some funky phasers. Okay, I'll see everybody back here at nine o'clock.